In this video, we're going to go over five common mistakes that I have seen other doctors and healthcare providers make that harm the fertility of the patients they are trying to help conceive. Make sure you watch this video so that you do not make the same mistakes. I'm Dr. Laura Shaheen. I'm a double board certified OBGYN and reproductive endocrinologist, helping people build families for over 20 years. A huge part of my job as a referral specialist, as a fertility doctor, as a reproductive endocrinologist is second opinions. So people often come to me and say, hey, I've tried this, I'm doing that. And I know you're the specialist and you can help people try to conceive. So let's go through what you've been doing. And I cannot tell you how many times over 20 years I have seen the same mistakes happen over and over again? And the hard part is, is that the doctors and the healthcare providers truly are trying to help and they don't realize that what they're doing is actually harming fertility. So in this video, we're going to go over five common mistakes that I have seen so you can make sure that you are not making them. And at the end of the video, stick around because I'm gonna go over three top tips to help you find the right doctor for you. Mistake number one, giving men testosterone when you know they are trying to have a baby. I cannot tell you how many doctors and healthcare providers I see do this. And it is a common kind of logical mistake. You think, oh, someone needs a better sperm count or they're feeling low. I know testosterone is going to make them feel better. If they want to have a baby, great, because I'm sure it's just going to help them have more sperm. Testosterone does the exact opposite. If your body sees testosterone from an outside source, whether it's a patch or a pill or a cream or a shot, then the testicles say, ah, oh, I don't need to make any testosterone. I see where it's coming from. It's coming from somewhere. I'm just going to take a vacation. And if the testicles are not making testosterone, guess what else they're not going to make? Sperm. So people who are taking testosterone will have lower and lower sperm counts. And I have actually seen azospermia. So people who've been on testosterone treatments, everybody's different. Usually takes multiple months to kind of get to that point. Uh, and they're so surprised because they still are able to perform, everything seems fine and seems to be working just great. But when you look under the microscope, there's an ejaculate there, but there's no sperm. So please, if you are trying to have a baby and you make sperm and your contribution <laughs> to building this family is providing sperm, do not take testosterone. Number two mistake, giving a woman progesterone every single day of the month. I've seen this more and more in the last couple of years. And I honestly don't know where this is coming from. Uh, people can check their testosterone. They say, oh, it's low. I've got to treat it. Um, first of all, just realize progesterone assays are not perfect. And progesterone is produced by the ovaries in a very pulsatile fashion. So it's hard to do a spot check and say like, oh, this is your progesterone representation for your entire luteal phase. So just testing testosterone in and of itself is inherently flawed. But if someone's going to take progesterone, and progesterone is amazing. Progesterone is an immunosuppressant. It is what our bodies make to help us accept the embryo. Like I love progesterone. I give progesterone to my patients all the time during fertility treatments, all the time. But it is only supposed to be seen at a certain time in the cycle. The way the cycle works is for the first half, like leading up to ovulation, your ovaries are only making estrogen. And that estrogen is talking to the uterus to build up a beautiful uterine lining. After ovulation, your ovaries still keep make a, a little bit of estrogen, but then they start making progesterone. And the embryo is supposed to come down into the uterine cavity and implant about six days after ovulation. So when we're doing a frozen embryo transfer cycle, for example, the embryo is ready, it's frozen, we're trying to get the uterine lining ready to accept the embryo, we give estrogen for two weeks, and then on the sixth day of progesterone, that's when we thaw the embryo and implant it. This is tried and true. We know from fertility treatments, if you give someone progesterone for two days 
and you do a transfer, they're not going to get pregnant. If you give it for eight days or nine days and you try to implant it, it's not going to implant. Your uterine lining is not supposed to ever see progesterone every single day. So I have people who are doing progesterone cream every single day or taking pills every single day. And they're just told, well, my provider said my progesterone was low and I should take it every single day. If you are taking progesterone every single day, you are decreasing the chances of an embryo implanting. You're actually harming your chances of getting pregnant. So if you take supplemental progesterone, you have got to be sure that you know when you're ovulating and then only start it a couple of days after ovulation. So luteal phase progesterone can be indicated in certain circumstances, but under no circumstances should you be taking progesterone every single day. I just saw a woman who is 41 years old and she's been doing this for three years trying to get pregnant and my heart is breaking. And it's so hard to tell someone that what they've been actively doing and being told by another provider could help them get pregnant is not helping. So don't make that mistake. Mistake number three, starting treatments before doing a semen analysis. Do not do this. It doesn't matter if someone has caused a pregnancy in the past. It doesn't matter if someone is 100% healthy and says, my libido is great. My sexual function is great. Everything seems to be fine. My boys are fine. I don't need a test. Absolutely not. Your current fertility may be different from your past fertility. And semen counts change all the time. And you cannot assume that you have a normal sperm count just because you've caused a pregnancy in the past. I just cannot emphasize that enough. I do not recommend doing fertility treatment without checking out both partners uh, because you can absolutely be surprised. Sometimes there's a dramatically low sperm count or even azospermia, which is like zero sperm. And you need to figure out why and you need to treat that and help bring up the sperm counts in order to have any success with fertility treatments like Clomid or Letrozole or, you know, ovulation induction. So just please don't make the mistake of assuming, you know, as a woman like, oh, fertility, baby making, it's got to be my fault. I am, you know, I'm sure it's me. Let me just do the treatment and I don't want to bother my partner or my partner is refusing to get a semen analysis. Just please don't make any assumptions. And I just do not recommend doing treatment without checking out both partners. Mistake number four, starting or really continuing treatment for too long before a full anatomy evaluation. I'll never forget, there was a patient who came to me after doing Clomid with her primary OB for two years. They did do a semen analysis, so we know that there was sperm, um, but they just kept doing Clomid, 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 Clomid. And I was like, well, we haven't checked your fallopian tubes. Like, what if your fallopian tubes are blocked? And sure enough, both of her fallopian tubes are blocked. And she was devastated. She wasted two years just doing treatment, making assumptions, and there was no way that she could have gotten pregnant over those two years. And so I'm so glad that we figured that out and we helped her. Um, but do not assume that your fallopian tubes are open just because you've had a pregnancy in the past. Or sometimes people assume, oh, I have regular menstrual cycles, therefore my fallopian tubes are open. Absolutely not. Um, the fallopian tubes being open have nothing to do with having a period. Um, you can still have a period and have regular ovulation and regular cycles and your fallopian tubes can be blocked. You can have no symptoms. Uh, you can have no pain. You could have, again, no changes in your cycle and still have blocked fallopian tubes. So just don't assume. Now, there are people who are at higher risk of having blocked fallopian tubes, like a diagnosis of endometriosis or a history of um, an ectopic pregnancy or history of abdominal or pelvic surgery, especially if it's associated with infection, like a ruptured appendix, those people should absolutely get a hysterosalpingogram or HSG as a test to make sure the fallopian tubes are open. I've got some great videos here that teach a lot about that particular test. Um, if you don't have risk factors, it is pretty reasonable to start some low tech treatment without doing that test, but don't let it go on for two years. It's just like, don't forget. And I'll talk to my patients about it. I'll be like, Hey, listen, 
um, a full fertility evaluation would include a history of salpingogram right now. Sometimes people are nervous about the pain um, or nervous about the invasive part because we are like putting fluid into the tubes and watching it flow through. Now for pain, in my clinic, we offer nitrous gas. So like laughing gas that you get at a dentist office. Pacific Northwest Fertility in Seattle, I am so proud of this. We pay attention to pain and we offer pain control at the HSG but we are the exception. Anyway, it's I can absolutely see how somebody would be a little bit nervous about getting that test done. But I say, okay, if we're not doing it right now, if you aren't pregnant in three cycles, help me remember, like I'm going to put a note in the chart, like let's not forget to do the HSG, okay? And so just think about that and talk to your doctor about whether you should do it now or if not now, kind of when. When would you think about doing it again? Just don't miss blocked fallopian tubes. Mistake number five is misinterpreting information. So this can happen for in a lot of different ways. I thought of two good examples. One example, it's very rare, but there are times where someone has what looks like normal counts and normal motility, but the volume, like the amount that's coming out in the semen analysis is extremely low. So it should be about 1.5 to even up to four milliliters. But sometimes people have like 0.1 milliliter, 0.2, really, really low amount of stuff coming out. But proportionately, you know, when you get a count, like a sperm count, it's sort of the number of sperm per ml. So it'll say like, oh, they've got 20 million sperm per ml. But then if you look at the amount, the milliliters, the ML that's coming out, it's really, really small. Pay attention to that because it's really rare. But I just diagnosed it last week. It's something called retrograde ejaculation. I know this sounds really funny, but when the sperm is kind of coming out of the vas deferens or the tube, it actually goes pretty close to the bladder. And there's this flap that kind of shuts down to make sure that the sperm goes out of the body and not into the bladder but sometimes that flap doesn't work very well and the sperm is actually going into the bladder, retrograde ejaculation into the bladder as opposed to outside of the body. And there's ways to figure that out if that's what's going on. And if that's going on, you know, it, it can look like, oh my gosh, this person has a really low volume, a really low count. They must do IVF in order to get pregnant. But if you figure out it's retrograde ejaculation, you can actually collect in a certain way and actually isolate the sperm and do something like an intrauterine insemination, or even some medications can help that flap work better. And you can maybe conceive without IVF. So this is really rare. But it's just kind of one of those things that you've been doing something for 20 years and you kind of see it multiple times. And this is not something that, you know, a lot of doctors would sort of be tuned into. Like it's rare um, and you have to really think about it. And it can be easy to like just be re reviewing results and just kind of miss it, honestly. Another thing on the female side that is a common mistake to miss out on and not understand is getting a FSH level, a follicle stimulating hormone. We actually do this test less and less, but it used to be a really important and normal part of a fertility evaluation. FSH is the follicle stimulating hormone that stimulates the ovary to recruit an egg and help it mature. Follicle stimulating hormone. And in the beginning of the cycle, the FSH should be really low. Um, and then it gets higher and higher and higher as it's encouraging the ovary to make the egg. So in the middle of the cycle, the FSH should be high, but at the beginning of the cycle, it should be really, really low. What's in, the way I think about it is FSH is like the gas and the ovary is like the car. So FSH is like getting the gas to go. And so if you have a high FSH in the beginning part of your cycle, when it's not supposed to be high, your car, your ovaries are requiring a lot of gas to go or to mature and ovulate an egg. And if you don't check an estradiol on the same day that you do your FSH, you can be fooled. So FSH and estradiol, estradiol is a type of estrogen. It comes from the ovaries. They kind of go back and forth with each other. As the estradiol rises, it sort of shuts down the FSH production. It says, all right, pituitary gland, relax a little bit. And so when you're checking your FSH, you're supposed to do it on cycle day three, can be cycle day two, three, or four, but typically cycle day three. And you have to check an estradiol on the same day because if that estradiol is really high, 
just happens to be the wrong day of the cycle, or you have a cyst that's making estrogen, whatever, if the estradiol is over 80, certainly over 100, that can falsely lower the FSH. So someone can get a cycle day three FSH and it can be eight. And you're like, ah, you're fine. Your ovarian reserve is fine. But if they checked an estradiol on the same day and saw that it was 100, they would say, oh, actually, that's not an accurate FSH. That's not an accurate result. Let's check it again last mo next month and see if we can get a more accurate result. I saw a 41-year-old woman. This is almost eight years ago. It was a long time ago. But she said, I know I'm fertile. I've been checking my hormones every single year with my primary gynecologist, and my FSH is perfect. And I look back and that never, ever, ever checked in estradiol. And I'm like, it's so great that your FSH has always been less than 10. That's our goal. But without the estradiol, it's sort of a non-result. I just, I'm not really sure. So again, this test isn't used that often anymore, but it can be a part of a fertility evaluation. And it's really, really common for people to just have the FSH done. And I'm looking through, I'm combing through their charts and I don't see the estradiol done. And I'm like, I, this is like a non-result. I can't really interpret it. So there are so many ways to misinterpret information and tests. These are just two pretty rare examples, but just really important because a lot of assumptions can be made. So let's recap. Please do not make these five mistakes. Number one, you have sperm, do not take testosterone if you want to have a baby. Number two, if you are cycling and you want to get pregnant, do not take progesterone every single day. Number three, do not start or do not continue for very long fertility treatment without doing a semen analysis. No assumptions. Number four, do not start or really don't continue fertility treatment for too long without confirming that the fallopian tubes are open. Again, no assumptions. And number five, be very careful with interpreting information and lab tests because sometimes there's subtle things that are easy to be missed and you just got to be sure. I hope this was helpful. I'm glad that you stuck around because I think it's really important to give you some tips on how to find the right doctor for you. Here are three thoughts. Number one, make sure you are really seeing a fertility specialist sooner rather than later. You can absolutely do testing and get started with your primary care doctor or your um, obstetrician, gynecologist. These are great people. They know you really well, I hope. And they do have some basic training, but just realize that even OBGYNs, they really do not spend a lot of their training, if very much at all, on fertility. I did a four-year OBGYN residency program before I subspecialized in a fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Um, my residency program was at UCSF. It was wonderful. It's like one of the best programs in the country. I had a great experience, but we didn't do a lot of fertility training. We focused on pregnancy and delivering babies and women's health and gynecology and surgery. And I'd say the smallest part of the overall training is actually fertility training. I really didn't get fertility training until I did my fellowship in it at Stanford, which was three years. So a fertility specialist, a reproductive endocrinologist like me, is fully trained in fertility and it's important to know and to move on to that specialist if things just aren't happening soon enough with your primary care doctor. That is not to speak ill of any primary doctor or OBGYN. It's just an awareness. Um, and a lot of times people say, gosh, I wish I'd come to see you sooner. Number two tip, find someone that listens to you. You want your questions to be answered you do not want to feel dismissed. You want to leave your doctor's office feeling heard. That is really important. And tip number three, do not be afraid to get a second opinion. Second opinions are so important. People just look at things in a different way. They have a different perspective. They saw a patient like you in the past. It reminds them of this other thing. And sometimes second opinions pick up on tests that haven't been done. Like I was a second opinion on that woman that had done Clomid for two years. I'm like, hey, we've never made sure your fallopian tubes are open. Let's do that. And it just really is nice to have a new set of eyes. I mean, people do this with other difficult diagnoses, like a cancer diagnosis or a chronic illness. It is okay and very important to get a second opinion. I have two videos here that might be helpful in finding the right doctor for you. I've got one that's basically like how to find the right fertility doctor and another video where it's kind of going through the red flags. Like if you are feeling this way, 
with your fertility doctor, it might be time to get that second opinion. I hope those two videos are helpful. I hope this video is helpful. I hope you really learned something today. Like this video if you learned something. Comment with questions that you have. Subscribe to this channel so you get my weekly video all about reproductive health. And until next week, I'm wishing you love, luck, and pineapples.